Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I just want to start by thanking V2 very much for inviting me to come. Um, as, as Anna was saying, Blast Theory, we're a group of, in fact, three artists these days. One fell by the wayside. And um, the work I'm going to present to you tonight is uh, a collaboration, um, both internally within the group, Ju, Rofar, Nick Tandavanich and I work collaboratively, but it's also a collaboration with the University of Nottingham, with whom we've worked over many years. And uh, since about 2000, we've been looking at making works that uh, mix gameplay with artistic uh, goals uh, that are using the city in some way or another. We made a piece of work in 2001 called Can You See Me Now, which was in fact um, presented here at the Dutch Electronic Arts Festival in 2003, which is a chase game where the people who are chasing are running through the streets of the city and the people who are being chased are online in a virtual model of the city. So we've been looking for a number of years at how you link um, people in mixed reality, in a reality that is partly uh, uh, um, the, the, the real world and partly a virtual space, and looking at how networks might extend the, uh, the space for artistic creation out into the streets and what happens when you do that. In the last couple of years, we've become particularly interested in where that leads in terms of participation. Um, Can You See Me Now, for example, as I said, is a chase game. It's a very narrow and deterministic sense, set of gameplay. Um, the structure of it is, is, quite, is quite clear from the outset. In 2003, we made a piece of work called Uncle Roy All Around You, which is a, a, an espionage game where you're looking for a, a, an elusive figure called Uncle Roy. Uh, the people who are looking for him on the streets have a PDA, a handheld computer, that, that guides them as they explore through the city people who are playing online are moving through a virtual model of the same area of the city and looking for, for Uncle Roy. And so this work is a, has a stronger kind of narrative element. It takes you an hour to play it, and you have to learn various things about Uncle Roy in order to find him. Uh, you end up inside a deserted office if you're playing on the streets, and when you come out of it, you get a call in a phone box, and you're picked up in a li in limousine and driven back in a, in a limousine if you complete the game successfully. So it's a kind of an ongoing kind of narrative um, exploration. But in, in, in our more recent work, we've been looking at, well, in, in what's the limit for involving the public in the work that we make? How much could we create a space in which the public themselves are co-creators of the work? And uh, wh what might that mean? Now, in some senses, this is kind of a, a cliche at the moment. You know, Web 2.0 refers to this huge swathe of activity related to participation and two-way uh, movement of media where the public are, are, cr are creators in, in some ways. But we've, we've kind of grown up to use quite an ugly term to talk about this. Uh, UGC is, what it, it, is normally the, 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 the kind of contraction that is used by, by people talking about this. That stands for user-generated content. And, you know, I, I just want to take a minute just to unpick a little bit what, what we might mean by user-generated content because it's, to me, a very, very ugly term, you know. Uh, user sort of is a, is a kind of systems design, mechanistic kind of view of people who are engaging in a system. It, it, it implies that your function within the system is someone who has use for it. And this is a kind of very utilitarian, very um, kind of computer human interface led idea of what people are doing when they are contributing to systems. Uh, generating, well, you know, generating is, 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 is again a, a mechanical process. You know, on, on a computer you have a, a piece of software called a, a random number generator. It's a piece of software designed to create semi-random numbers. And so, you know, we use generator in the term of engines and in terms of pieces of software. And then content, you know, is this this horribly kind of vague and loose term for sort of almost anything you can put in a bucket is content. You know, it's it's things that you that fill up what you've made. And um, the way in which we would, would prefer to think about this is rather than user-generated content, I think it would be a much richer and more interesting set of terms to say it's about publicly created contributions, that it's actually about the public, and by that you, you, we, you invite us to think about the, the, the people who are engaged as, as a public in a civic sense, you know, that, that, that publis, is the origin of that is about the, the, the civil society that um, they are creating, that you know, people are expressing themselves when they engage with systems. And when, and when they do so, they are contributing, they are giving to this shared civic space. 
And so that's um, a, a, a kind of, you know, a, a kind of guiding thought for us about, um, a, a, about how you might drive participation. One of the kind of cliches that's come up about user-generated content is the idea that most of it will be shit and that therefore you need a whole set of super systems to, to, to weed out and drive away the enormous torrents of dross that will inevitably result. So, you know, the traditional way is to have rating systems or commenting systems and so on, editorial intervention to make sure that good stuff rises to the surface. And, you know, again, there's a, there's a kind of quite a sinister political implication there. It's the sense that, yes, we'll let users engage with these systems, but we accept that these users are so cack-handed, they're so facile, that the vast majority of it will, it will inevitably ru be rubbish. And we, you know, we need to set up a whole set of systems to purify, you know, to, 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 to a sort of alchemical process to boil off, you know, the real goods, the goods quality stuff and make sure that everything else kind of sinks to the bottom. We became interested in whether this is really true and, and whether it's not just to do with the, with the very utilitarian nature of these tools themselves, the fact that they're so, they're so bland themselves, that that's why they invite uh, uh, content of enormously differing qualities and levels because these are intended, in, intended to be kind of commercial platforms that will hold anything. They are intended to be the biggest buckets around. And we might perhaps be able to come up with models for user-generated content, for publicly created contributions that are heavily contextual and therefore invite you to engage in different ways. So, uh, you know, you might think about this as in the same sense of sort of democracy. If, if you just make democracy handing megaphones to people in the streets, you would almost inevitably get kind of random things back in return because there is no motivating factor, there's no guiding structure, there's no rich context there that would shape what you would do if someone thrust a megaphone into your hand as you walk down the street. And so this is sort of seems to me that this is where, where we've got to in terms of participatory structures. Uh, the work that I want to show um, this evening is, is a piece called Rider Spoke. Uh, it's um, a work for cyclists, and what we what we tried to do was test out this this idea. Could we could we create a rich context in which the contributions that people made would be would be specific enough that they would have a, they would have a certain um, interest at, at, at uh, um, you know a, a high level of interest and a very particular level of specificity about them, that we invite into people to talk in a specific way. And um, I've got a, a kind of um, a five minute video clip that, I, that I'd like to show. Um, and I'm gonna show it right now. We would like you to cycle through the city making recordings and eavesdropping on recordings made by other people. To do that, you're going to be using one of these. You're going to have an earpiece and a microphone. This is one of those moments when you're on your own. You might feel a little odd at first, a bit self-conscious or a bit awkward, but you're all right and it's okay. Relax and find somewhere that you like. It might be a particular building or a road junction. When you have found somewhere you like, give yourself a name and describe yourself. So I'm standing at opposite circus I'm not too far from Clark and Mill Green. I'm hiding by an old church on Helmet Road. I'm at the junction of Cheapside and Wood Street. Somewhere behind St. Bartholomew's Hospital. I found a building that's probably the shortest building in the area.
Yo, this is Quincy. My name today is AJ. My name is Ascendant. I am Grey, Stark, and Colonial. Um, my name's James. I'm Ella, and I'm 41, and I'm afraid. in the hot tub with the aunt on one side singing the sound of music songs and the beautiful 21 year old twin on the other so it was a bit of snoggage. Beautiful lung Claudia ended up taking her top off and her aunt told me to suck her nipples. What could I do? You know, I was just a guest at this family Christmas. Please will you cycle back towards a busier place and look for someone who catches your eye. Just watch them and follow them. Um, I didn't get to see her face, um, but she has led me to um, Angel, which is where I used to live. I used to live with a girl called Caroline, my ex-girlfriend. Um, so why not call uh, the girl in the hood uh, that was her distinguishing feature. Anyway, let's call her Caroline. His hands always felt like paper. Paper sounds like a negative thing, but it's not. He has the softest hands, and but there's something dry about them that's so beautiful. I feel like I can feel the creases. And there's a comfort, and when I hold his hands, I feel held and and just so many things I want but don't feel like I have right now at this moment. And yeah, that's it. You've been writing for a while now. I have one last thing to ask you. Will you make me a promise? It might be small. A promise about tomorrow or a friend. It might be something more profound. But now, tonight, say your promise out loud into the air. Even though it's almost impossible, I really am going to try my best not to be afraid. Because I've been afraid so much. And to make some choices. If for no other reason than in honor of the people who can't make choices at all anymore. For Hope and Danny and Marcus and Mary, Lewis and Martha, and Liz Oberstein, and especially Ben. We got to make so few at all. Um, you can see that in that work, um, context is everything. Uh, you know, each of those recordings that those people are making, they're making in a specific place in the city. They're choosing where to make their recording, and then that recording is stored at that location. And only someone who comes to that same location can hear the recording. And in this, in that version that you see there, which was made in London, there were about three thousand recordings made over the eight days that the that the project was running. And uh, all, all, uh, almost all of them are, have, have a quality of um, specificity and, and authenticity that makes them engaging. You know, we, ha we had one recording out of those two and a half, three thousand that is actually ki kind of um, rejecting the notion of doing this thing, they, saying, this is rubbish, I don't know what to say. Everything else varies in quality, of course, you know, it varies in, in terms of how much it engages, but all of those things all of those recordings feel meaningful and heartfelt to the person who, who makes them. Uh, and one of the things that's important about 
making works that start to happen out in the city and starting to use location-based technology. You know, as we've seen from, from Stefan and Matthias's talk, there's, there's lots and lots of, of work that does this, is what do you do with location? You know, okay, you now have the ability to make a game out in the city space. What kind of location is this? Uh, you know, it, you could treat it as a game space in which it's purely a kind of set of architectural constructs through which you can run and do things. And early location-based games like Bot Fighters, like Can You See Me Now, uh, definitely do that. You know, they treat the city as a kind of architectural game space and use the properties of where you can run, where you can't run, where you can drive and where you can't drive as, as functions of the game. But as we develop further, we need to think about the full richness of the city. And the context in that case is not about physical location. It's about, um, sure, it's a function of where you are, but it's also a function of the time of day, the fact that you're alone in, in Rider Spoke at night on a bicycle. Those three things are critical determinants of in what frame of mind you approach this. Um, what, what, what type, you know, what, what uh, area of the city you're in, how it feels to you, whether it feels safe or not safe, whether it feels crowded and busy or not busy, these are actually critical parts of context. And I, I, I kind of want to finish by talking a little bit about how um, uh, Rider Spoke deals with uh, the, the, what's the underlying model of location that's used in, in this work? Because it's not GPS, it uses Wi-Fi hotspots. And that means that wherever you are in the city these days, you can nearly always see a small number of Wi-Fi hotspots. And if I'm stood right here and I can see eight Wi-Fi hotspots, I can say, well, when I see these eight, I am here. And I may find that as I walk in that direction, one of them gets dropped or I pick up another one, and that, that collection may then be thought of as a new location. And that's how Rider Spoke deals with, with location. So, um, you know, obviously this is less accurate on a strictly kind of scientific basis than GPS. But it involves a different understanding of what location is. Because location is then generated through the landscape of telecommunications networks that are there. The, 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 the network itself is giving rise to location. And location itself is a kind of negotiable, flexible, fluid thing. Some, someone might turn off their, their Wi-Fi access point, and the computer may be looking for that access point for that location. That location may cease to exist. So location itself is a kind of constantly fluid, changing thing. Uh, a theorist in the University of Glasgow called Matthew Chalmers has written about the idea that location-based games and locative media are not dealing with seamless environments as they are always portrayed to be, a place where you walk through the city with your mobile phone constantly in connection, you're always in touch with people, the GPS is telling you where you are, but rather you should think of it as seem full places because of course they are all deeply dysfunctional, these technologies, at one level or another. You only have to go in through an underpass or inside a, a, a deep building to lose contact. GPS is even more flaky, it even varies according to the time of day. So. The, the, the kind of technical infrastructures that you're using when you work with location-based media are seamful, are, 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 are constantly changing and fluid. And so what we've tried to look at is whether we can make a piece of work that, that exploits that level of fluidity and, and uses that sense in which the, the, the particular location that you're at is much less important than the overall context in which you're cited. Uh, and I'm gonna finish by just saying that I bought a few sets of postcards to give away. If anyone would like one, you're very welcome. But I'm going to stop there. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. Um, that was that was great. Um, when, when I look at your work uh, and uh, when I compare, for example, can you see me now with your recent work? Um, one thing what really strikes me is that you also really moved from, let's say, uh, a spectator's perspective to a very individual perspective. And when uh, I saw the lady on the bike riding, uh, I was really wondering how do you uh, measure or determine the impact on such an individual uh, level? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, well, uh, you know, one, one of the things that's, that's interesting about it is it's, it's a shift back towards a more artistic mode of practice because actually the way in which 
we determine that is through doing the work, you know, engaging with the work ourselves, and it's very personal and a, a kind of direct emotional response in, on an individual level to the work that is, that is one of the keys is, is, is as we develop that, that piece of work is going out, cycling, the, what it's like to listen, what it's like to receive a question, what it's like to be given a question and then invited to choose a place for the answer. Uh, the other kind of slightly more kind of um, systematic way in which we do it is through uh, an iterative process where we're sending out other people as soon as we've got something that's workable enough, sending out other people and doing quite detailed interviews with them when they return, maybe for 20 minutes or half an hour each person to talk through what happened to them out there. And one of the things that you get with, with this particular work is people have lots of anecdotes and stories that they want to tell about things that have happened to them because they feel that they've been on a very kind of personal, kind of inward looking journey. Um, and our collaborators at the University of Nottingham also um, do quite a lot of study. So there was a, 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 a 90 page evaluation document that was written about Rider Spoke, which is based on studies of uh, the logs and you know traditional forms of computer science, but it's also based around interviews and questionnaires, so people give their, their feedback in those ways. Yeah, I, I was actually uh, also wondering if you, uh, how you deal with different architectures in different cities, for example, because the impact on, uh, of the architecture or the urban environment on a very personal level probably has to be uh, taken into account quite uh, drastically as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the city is an inherently kind of entropic and chaotic space. And so that's, again, one of the real challenges of how, how you deal with that. I mean, this, this particular version of the Barbican, it has a very particular kind of set of um, resonances because the Barbican is the medieval heart of the old city of London and you all the street names, the street plan to very large degrees still follows a medieval street plan and so it has a kind of sense of historical um, kind of reference. The Barbican itself is a term for a medieval fortification. You know, the, the, the most recent version of this we did was in Athens, you know, where it's a completely different landscape. But you know, in, in works like that we had done in the past, like Uncle Royal Around You, we were then attempting to author in a sensitive, um, a kind of detailed way in relation to the cities as we toured the work. And this became more and more apparent to us that we were kind of existing in some kind of modernist sort of capsule where, you know, we're attempting to sort of drop into a city and sum up kind of the aspects of the city. And that's where some of the structure of Writer's Spoke comes from, which is to say, well, actually, let's have the map itself be self-configuring, you know, the map doesn't really exist before the, the, the piece starts, it actually is built in real time, and let's have the public themselves set where the content lies and where the, where the interest is, so it's an attempt to try and, you know, that's what the co-authoring is about, is to kind of use those people who really understand the city and try and give them rights of authorship and ownership in some sense. Now, you know, you can, you can overstate this, that case, so I'm aware, you know, there's a few caveats there, but... That's the intention. Is there somebody from the audience uh, who wants to ask, let you, uh, something? Yeah, I'm just going to hand over the microphone for the stream. Uh, I'm wondering if you, uh, uh, after you've gathered all this data, if you map it out in any uh, way, or do you consider the, the experience of the piece the only uh, product of it as well? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a real, um, dilemma because people really want to be able to access recordings after the event and at the, you know in terms of our conception of the work it was so important that the recording is is hidden and you have to cycle physically expend energy to find it and yet what we're finding is that people repeatedly when they come back say please please you know make an online version of this so I can go back and, and see what's happened um, and the the, the one of the researchers at the University of Nottingham is doing his PhD on some of these issues around mapping. And he has built software that is capturing all of the fingerprints, all of the ways in which they connect. It's the contigu contiguities of the fingerprints that actually create the, um, the, the map. And so he is doing some kind of study, but it's, 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 it's very much driven by him in terms of what he's then trying to extract from, from that data. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Matt Thanks. Adams.